Hi everyone. It's me again. What a surprise. Um okay, so um today I had an end game from uh a game between Magnus and Caruana. I think you guys can read it in the title, right? So um wait actually let me let me make this a tiny bit smaller so that you don't see the settings underneath. Um yeah, so I think this is good. Stunty, I feel like every time I want to change the piece set, it's it's a it's a mistake. So <laughs> I don't know, but today uh, I had planned to talk about a very nice endgame between Carlsen and Caruana. Um, both extremely powerful, extremely extremely talented players. They're both playing in the uh, Waikanse or Tata still happening right now. I think you guys most likely have seen the event. Um, so definitely check it out. I remember that the Carlsen Ferrucia game from Maron One was very very nice. Um, actually, as I was saying like a moment ago in the other in the other lecture, um, I was playing a tournament in the Charlotte Chess Center, and oftentimes like before our rounds, uh, there was like the live coverage, um, of the title still on the on the TV, and we would all just kind of gather up and watch it up until it was time to play. So we did uh, kind of watch that tournament um, as it was happening. And I would recommend you guys to, to watch it if you're not watching it already. But this, is, this game is not from that tournament. This is from 2012. And I guess the first thing I can ask you guys is, what do you think of the position? Usually there are a few different things that you guys need to consider. You need to consider, of course, first thing is the material. Uh, the placement of the pieces, how are the kings doing, and the pawn structures. So, um, so first thing I should ask you guys is, what do you think about this end game? Is it just a plain draw? Should, should they just like agree to a draw? You know, right now, is there a chance to win for for either side? What do you guys believe seeing this position? Would you play on if you were, if 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 you were playing as either color? What do you think? Is the king weak or active in the endgame? I don't know. Do you think it can get checkmated on f3? Um, White has a good king. Draw. Okay. Material is equal. Black should have a slightly better pawn structure. But White has a better king. Um, do you actually think that black has a better pawn structure because i i guess i understand you in the sense that white has um more pawn islands but at the same time which pawn do you think is naturally weaker in this position this one or this one because i would say the b7 pawn is also a backwards pawn so what do you guys think Black has a passed pawn. Um, I wouldn't really consider the b7 pawn a, a, a passed pawn because it's fixed by the pawn on, on a4, so it's never going to be able to to actually get all the way to where he wants because the pawn on a4 is just simply stopping it. So, yeah. All right. So, if you had to play for either side, what do you guys think? Like, if you had to play either side, if you were looking at this position, it's like, okay, pick a side. What do you guys think? You would play white? Okay. Any other thoughts? White, white. Essentially, this is uh, most likely close to equal endgame. But if there is one side that has chances to win is white. So this endgame is not straight up winning for white and it's also definitely not a not a technical force to win, of course. 
it's more practical than that um but there are very small factors that kind of help with this with this narrative so the first one is the king on f3 it is so much better than the king on g8 no it is not a weak king because we are in the end game and not only that the king can only be weak if it goes towards the center if it can get checkmated and in this position it doesn't feel like black has enough pieces to to get it checkmated and i say this a lot on my streams a weakness is not a weakness unless you can attack it and right now you can't really go after the king on f3 so it just happens to have several tempos um over the the, the black king on g8 so um that's one thing also probably the most arguable thing is that you guys were mentioning white has three pawn islands meanwhile black has two and usually you want to have as less pawn, pawn islands as possible but right now the pawn on c3 is better protected than the pawn on b7 the pawn on b7 is a backwards pawn and it's never really going to be able to cooperate with the pawn on a5 because it's backwards so um it's it's always got to be defended by actual pieces no pawns so and the bishop on d4 has some solid control of this the bishop on c7 has less mobility than this bishop so they're all very very small factors but they compile up if, if black doesn't play this right so i want to ask you guys uh let me flip the board real quick if you guys were black pieces in this position which is actually black to move What's your first instinct? Like, what do you do? Also, remember, in uh, endgames of bishops with the same color, you want to put your pawns the opposite color of the bishops so that they cannot get attacked by any means. You usually want to put the pawns on the opposite color. I mean, now there are rooks, so it's maybe a little bit more flexible, that rule. But essentially, that's one of the things you have to keep in mind. King f8, you want to trade rules, uh, rooks, sorry. But um, but after king f8, there's bishop c5. You had to uh, watch out for that. Um, f5, holding back the black, the white king. Um... I guess that could be a possibility. I'm kind of worried that the pawn gets weak somehow. But I don't see a way where that can happen right away. Maybe something... Actually, maybe something like f5 and then rook takes, takes, and rook b1 with the idea of getting into b5. Maybe that's a thing, actually. Maybe that's a thing. Um, yeah. A better move would have been um, a better move would have been h5 and the idea of this is that you're going to do with this move you're kind of preventing g4 and you're kind of stopping white from getting all of the con the, the control or the space that they want um, so with h5 you know if they want to play g4 you can trade and that's fine um, and you're kind of uh, restricting white a little bit so h5 is kind of the most natural move here is it the only move not really but it's kind of just the most natural move in this position because you're restricting white from playing g4 and g4 is a move that they do want because they put the pawn on a light square but at the same time it controls space on the king side so um yeah so h5 is a move that black would have liked to play However, they ended up playing b6. So, um, they ended up playing b6. Oh, uh, how can they get the king out? Then you can play like f6, king f7. But, um, but h5 is kind of, you know, a move that you should have thought about earlier. Yeah, sorry, h5. <laughs> Karpov just sat up from his bed. Um, I mean, yeah, b6 is not really a pretty move, right? Like, now the bishop on c7 is kind of stuck. 
having to defend upon, right? That's not what they would want to do. Um, rookie 3 and Rookie 1. We're going to see that idea soon. We're going to see that idea soon. So after B6, Rook B1 was played, putting pressure on the pawn. Rook A C8. It's kind of indirectly um, defending the pawn. Because if, for example, um, let's say if let's say if rook takes takes takes, there's gonna be rook b8. Now, do you guys think that this is still okay, and you can play something like bishop takes, rook takes, and bishop takes c7, or do you think that this line is not good, not good to give up the the um, exchange uh, to get the two pawns. Like, would you actually consider getting the bishop and the two pawns for the rook? Or do you think that it's not enough? Not sure, since the promotion squares aren't dark. Not good. Okay, so you guys seem to not like it. From what I can see right now. <laughs> not good if you're not a GM. Yeah, the issue is that the pawns are falling later. So I'm glad you guys noticed that. So for example, after takes, takes, bishop takes. Uh, there's going to be rook to c1. And when the bishop comes to e5 to defend, even to a5 it's the same story. Rook a1 and this pawn on a4 is falling. So essentially you're just going to have this pawn. And that's not enough to win, and you may even have to be careful and fight for a draw. So, yeah. So this line wouldn't have been good, but in this position, um, white is about to take the the next step on, you know, improving their position and trying to get more dominant and inside the black territory. What are we doing? We're looking at this practical in-game um, between Carlsen and Caruana. It's two rooks and bishop. Bishops of the same color, that's very important. And it's how white slowly built up an advantage and created a win out of it. So g4, that's one idea. They just made like a more active move. Um, like a more controlling move now. Yeah, rook e4 is very nice. Yeah. Uh, you can trade a pair of rooks and play rook b5, but that may be too many trades. Like after takes, takes, rook b5, the rook can come to e6 and it protects the pawn and it cuts the king. So the rook is very nice on e6. You don't really want to give your opponent the chance to, to have active defenders or active pieces. Um, but rook e4 is a very nice move because, you know, if takes, takes, now the king is closer and it can get in. And that's definitely not what black wants. And also all of the white pawns are protected. So it's not like, you know, after something like this here, the rook can get in and suddenly the, all the pawns get traded off and it's a draw. It's not really the case, there's just like king c6. And the position is super good for white. Um, so they do not want to trade rooks. They do not want to trade rooks on e4 because the king can just get in. Um, therefore, at this point, they're just kind of uh, hoping to, to double up the rooks and get control of the file, right? If they want to. Or they can start bringing the, keys, the king over to the other side. But the rook on e4 is a very nice move. Um, what about rook e4, f5? Okay. Rook e4, f5. Now, it feels like something that was mentioned earlier can be done now, which is takes, takes, and rook b5. Now, 
they don't have time to play rook to e6, as I mentioned, because the f5 pawn is hanging. And not only is the f5 pawn hanging, but when you play the rook to b5, the rook is now protected by this pawn. So you can take here, oops, sorry, you can take here without worrying about this pin that we had before. Remember that the rook was on b1 and it wasn't really protected by anything? Now it's protected by the pawn on a4, so we're threatening the pawn on b6 and the pawn on f5, and there's no way they can defend both of them at the same time. So, yeah. I mean, usually in these endgames you may not think about it, but there are very subtle tactics oftentimes, and that's why they're so difficult to play. Because if you miss one small tactic, then you're kind of busted. So, uh, usually in endgames, you kind of need to, yeah, play, kind of play more freely, more practically, more according to principle. Then in middle game, because in middle game you have more pieces, you need to calculate more, make sure that there are no tactics. But, um, yeah, in endgame you also need to keep your eyes open. You can't just blindly um, play solidly, you know, without thinking. Because you may miss a tactic, and if you do, it's probably a lot harder to recover. So, just saying. And I know it's difficult because it's the last stage of the game, so you're probably tired from the from the whole game that you have been playing so far but it's really important to to stay awake in end games too so yeah and i would really recommend you guys reading books about end games like the Boretsky end game manual uh the Silman book 100 end games you should know uh practical end games all of those so I mean, not all of those. You can read. I mean, you can read all of those if you want to, but it's a lot of content. So I would just recommend you to check them out. I know Chessables has some some courses in some of those. I think Chessable has a course on the hundred endgames you should know. So if it's easier for you to do it that way too, but yeah, endgames are important because you don't want to play a pretty awesome game and then screw it up in the endgame because you didn't do the right technique. So yeah. But okay, so after rook e4, g6 was played. Now, what do you guys think of g6 here? Like, is it really meaningful? Or do you just think, well, it's a move? <laughs> Decent, okay. A bit weakening. That is true. F6 is better. Um, H5 actually would have been a lot better. Yeah, it's difficult to get out with the Black King. Yeah, so G6, according to uh, the commentators of, of this game, uh, G6 is kind of like the losing move. Um, Maybe it's not like straight up losing, but it makes the position like so tough to defend that it's like almost losing. And the reason why is because, well, it doesn't really achieve anything. It weakens the diagonal. It also weakens the pawn on h6. And now after uh, the move g4, which is very, very strong, the pawn on h6 is going to be kind of fixed there uh, onto the same color of the bishop so that just we can, go, we can just go and attack it. And if you ever play h5, you know the, the pawn structure is about to mess up, so. Uh, it's not like you can play this move. And um, essentially, the pawn on h6 is just going to be fixed. White has control with g4. And the position becomes a lot more pleasant. The king can't really do anything. Um, it's just not really a move that you needed to make, so. g4 is very strong because it restricts the pawns from black. And at the same time, uh, it gains space on the on the king side. So essentially what you want to do is to try and fix your opponent's pawns on the same color of the bishop. And that's what they did to the h6 pawn right now. And you see that the h6 pawn, it may be like, well, how are you going to attack it? But eventually you're going to see how it was done. And um, little by little, the more that white controls more space in the position, the more difficult it's going to be for for black later on 
because um I don't know, it's just they won't really have great moves. So essentially you're kind of restricting black more and more and more as the game progresses and it becomes more and more difficult for them to make moves, which prompts them to making like a radical move that ends up being a really big weakness. So yeah. Alright, so g4 was played, as I was mentioning, um, h5 would have been a little bit better in this position, uh, so that if they play, you know, g4, at least there's going to be some trades, and then maybe you can play like f6, bring the king to f7, uh, but g6 is uh, an inaccuracy, g4, extremely strong move. And now, uh, King F8 was played. Now, do you guys think F5 is a possibility? There is like a tactical reason why it isn't. What do you guys think? And this is why it's important to... Um, do tactics or no tactics even in the end game just to make sure that your lines work out rook e3 now you guys have something more active you guys have actually a way to win a pawn i'll give you that hint Oh, you guys are seeing it, kind of. Yeah, not rook e6 because the rook can take it, so that's not really great. Um, but let's see. So after uh, takes, takes, rook takes, rook takes, there's this really nice move, rook g1, using the fact that we have kind of split up the pawns from the the pawns from black. And after king f8, you don't want to play king f7 because of rook g7, and you're going to go after this bishop. Uh, but after king to f8, there's this really nice move, rook g6. And you're attacking both. And this rook doesn't have an active square where you can defend both of them or anything. So, yeah. Um, what do you guys think about this line? It's very nice, right? Because, you know, you manage to infiltrate your rook. And once you take the pawn on h6, actually, like, the pawn on h can move fast, and h8 is actually covered by the bishop, so... If you manage to take the h6 pawn, it's really nice. But yeah, both pawns are falling, and the position is collapsing overall for, for black, so yeah. Black is done, kind of. Kind of. Um... Kind of. So, let's see. H4, uh, sorry, G4. King to F8 was played. And now H4. What do you guys think is the idea of this move? What do you guys think is the idea of this move? Remember what I was mentioning earlier about opposite color bishops. Exactly. So the idea is to play h5. The idea is to play h5 and fix this pawn on h6. So that when we can afford to trade pieces. And once we do that, we can uh, go after the h6 pawn, take it, and win the endgame. It's usually very, very nice if you have endgame with minor pieces or just with some pieces. And your pawn structure is better so that if you trade some of the pieces, you can win the endgame. Like, that's, that's usually like a huge, huge thing because you can afford to do trades. So you can kind of force your position to... To work out if that makes sense because you know if you provoke trades you're gonna be fine 
So yeah, h5 is the idea, fixing the pawn on h6, and then in the future you can you can go after it and take it. So so yeah. Um but yeah, h4 is a very nice move. Now rook takes e4 was played. Uh bishop d8 could have been another move looking after this. Uh rook takes king takes doesn't really achieve anything. Just bring brings the king closer to the center. But uh, here you can play h5. And after takes, takes, the pawn on, a, on h6 is fixed. Um, and... Wait. Is there bishop g7? Oh, did I miss that somehow? I think bishop g7, king takes, rook takes. There's this. Maybe. Yeah, there is probably this, and then the bishop can take on h4. I think. And that's the reason why. You wouldn't necessarily want to go for this. Because let's say if king g2, for example, there may be bishop takes, rook takes, and rook here. And now the endgame is not super clear. Yeah. Um, Magnus' great contribution as a world champion is to look at an end game and zero point one uh, point zero one, and then say winning. I mean, it's only he who has that ability most of the time. But yeah, if rookie rookie three, I think, uh, or did someone say rookie three now? Essentially, this is a threat. And this is a threat, and this is also a threat. So it's not super clear how to continue here as, as, as white. But yeah, I'm guessing that's why bishop g7 doesn't work. I kind of forgot that was a move, honestly. But I'm glad to see that, uh, unfortunately, you know, doesn't work. But after bishop d8, um, you can continue with h5 and after takes takes rook to e7 rook to g1 oops sorry rook to g1 with the idea of bishop to g7 and taking on h6 later rook to c6 defending rook e g4 rook to e6 and after rook g8 king up rook h8 and now the other rook is going to come in and this is winning so this would have been a variation This would have been a variation. Um, but they didn't play bishop d8. They just played rook takes e4, king takes e4, rook e8. And uh, what would you guys have played here, actually? If you were white pieces, what would you do? King d5 or king d3? King f3. I haven't thought about that one. You wouldn't necessarily want to go back to that side of the board. You kind of want to enter with your king through the, through the king side. Okay, so let's see. King d5 is a very active move. Uh, however, I think uh, maybe what Carlsen didn't like was rook to e6. Still, the position is super good for white. Uh, he just decided to be a slightly more cautious and he played king d3. Um, but I mean, the, the, the options, both of them are good. King d3, rook to e6 was played, still defending. Bishop to e3 now, attacking this pawn. King g7, rook b5. Bishop to d8, h5. Rook d6, king c4. This is all looking great so far. 
Rook c6, king d5. Of course, this is not possible. Why? Why is that not possible? Yeah, bishop d4. Bishop d4, and there's no... No good follow up for black. So after king d5, Caruana decided to go back to, to e6. Bishop d4 was played, king to f8, moving the king back. Bishop f6 would have been another move, but this is not actually very great. So they could have played rook takes. Uh, bishop takes, rook takes, pawn takes, king takes d4, and white is winning because they have a fast pawn. Um, so after bishop f6, rook takes, they had to take on b6. Bishop takes, takes, king c4, bishop e1, king b5, king, C, king f6, f3, g5 takes. What do you guys think about this thinking? Like, is it just a draw? Is it winning for one side? Draw, winning for white. Seems certainly winning for white. I'll need to count for a sec though. Yeah, it's important to calculate these end games. You don't really want to get into them and then realize that you and your opponent are promoting at the same time when you had an objectively winning position. So. Yeah, it's really hard to cover the pawn, exactly. So, for example, here after bishop d8, king takes, a5, bishop back, a6, bishop a7, and now bishop b6, king, uh, bishop to b8, and king to c6. And the king is going to get into b7, and there's no way to stop this. Um, and I'll give you guys a hint that usually... The bishop wants two long diagonals to prevent the pawn from promoting. And of course, here they only have, sorry, here they only have one diagonal. They don't really have another one. You can't really consider this a diagonal. So uh, this endgame is a loss. So yeah. Um, how about immediately bishop b6? Uh, like here, bishop b6. I guess that's also an option. And then you go around with your king and then play this. But yeah, so bishop f6, there was rook takes b6, unfortunately, and the bishop endgame is not as equal as it may look at first. So after bishop d4, king to f8 was played. Now, what is the next step of the plan? To keep gaining space, to keep controlling controlling and pushing black backwards because you know the king is already good the, the rook is already the, the rook is already good the bishop on d4 is very good uh what is the next step f4 but what is the idea Yeah, exactly. The king is safe. F4 is actually very nice. And the idea is that you're later going to play with F5, right? So F4, bishop to C7 was played, and now F5. And you see how you're keeping your pawns, uh, how white is, is keeping their pawns on the opposite color as the bishops. And never, ever, ever are the pawns going to be attacked this way because the bishop can't really get to them. You know, and the rook alone is not going to go after the pawns and take them. So the pawns are getting fixed on the on the right square, on the right color. Rook d6 was played, king to e4. Rook to c6. And now a very nice idea was played. And yeah, exactly. H pawn is weak. 
is there a way you guys can make use of the fact that the h bone is weak and can you guys do kind of like a um second weakness type of attack like the main weakness is b6 now you go towards the second weakness put pressure on it until black's position collapses so um there's a way you can regroup your pieces right now to go after the pawn on h6 and i mean pieces not just like it should be three or something like you know all of the pieces it's more of a plan than just one move <laughs> screw this we went before this um hopefully that would be very nice if you can it changed on g6 and then what what happens after that Any ideas? Rook b3. You can move the rook to a better square than b3. The bishop can stay on d4 for now. You don't really need to get it to e3 right now. Rook d4. I don't think that's possible though. Rook d5. Um, that could maybe be a move. Uh, rook d5. Maybe king e7. I mean, that's look fine, but why did like a stronger plan? How do you go after the pawn on h2 with your, on h6, sorry, with your rook? Is there a way you can go after it with the rook? What do you guys think? Takes on g6 to open up the file. Um, they made a move before it, but yeah, it could be an option. We can play actually uh, this move. Rook h1. And it's a very nice idea because you're bringing the rook all the way over to h1. See? So you're going to bring all the rook all the way over. And it's going to put pressure on h6 also combined with this it's gonna be combined so um yeah uh takes is not really something you need to worry about because then we have the similar ideas that we talked about before of here and here um and the position is very good for for black but after rook b1 essentially the idea is to go to h1 and put pressure on h6 g5 for black here but if you play g5 like it just closes up the position even more and it's going to be even easier for me to go after your pawns afterwards so um in this position i would say maybe rook, rook b5 looks good um actually you also have king d5 and if rook here king here i would presume um something like this and it takes could be an idea but yeah i think they didn't take on g6 beforehand because i don't want to trade as many pawns remember they're going for the win so they don't really want to trade pawns if it's not necessary so but yeah after rook b1 rook e8 was played and then pawn takes 
takes and now rook h1. If you had done it the other move order, the rook would be on e on b1 and not on h1. So that's that's why. But rook h1 now, and it's not really possible to defend the pawns. Let's say king f king f7. Uh, would you guys take? Yeah, I'm glad to see you guys are saying no. Um, yeah, it's it's not good to take right now. Because of pawn takes, and this is a check, so there's going to be a big issue with our rook, right? So, um, after a king f7, king d5, rook to d6, king to c4, takes takes, Bishop d8, uh, bishop d8, yeah. But now, um, simply f6 was played. And this is a very nice idea. Very nice idea because you kind of block the connection between the rook and the pawn on h6. And there is no way that black can successfully defend it. So, yeah. If uh, king here, for example... Um, I think you can just play rook g1, and if king goes back, rook here. And this is kind of winning for, for, for white, so yeah. What about bishop e7? Um, like, where? Oh, here? Bishop e7? That's kind of what happened in the game. Um, I think it has to stop the promotion. Then you push f7 if the king steps over. Um, I don't know what you mean exactly. Like, if here, here, um. I mean, if we go f7, the king can take it, I think, and uh, h6 is covered. So now the rook defends it. And if this, you kind of have bishop e7. And I think that's the only move that stops it, so. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I just think it's easier probably to go king g, uh, sorry, rook g1. And bring the rook to, to g7 or g8 eventually and help the promotion of this pawn. Also, bishop e5 and king d5 are an idea anytime, so um, I mean, it just looks super good for white, essentially. Um, but yeah. So that wasn't played. Bishop takes f6 was played. And now rook takes, bishop e7 how is this endgame? <laughs> so a ghost. Just trade rooks and go king b5. Exactly. Trade rooks and go king b5. Uh, king b5. Bishop b6 was just another move. It's not any worse. But king b5, king e6, takes, king d7, c4, king c8, bishop takes a5, king b7. Quick question, what move would you guys do here? It's mainly between bishop b4 and c5, so far. What do you guys think, all of you? c5.
A lot of people are commenting C5. I think you guys are beginning to realize it. Yeah, so the right move here, the right move here is um, bishop b4. d5 has uh, one extremely big inconvenience, which is bishop takes c5. King takes c5 and king a8. And you guys are not going to be able to, to win this position as much as you try. Um, simply because you can't win it if the bishop is not the same color as the promotion square. So for those of you who don't know this endgame, uh, the bishop is the opposite color as a promotion square. So there's no way that that the bishop is going to help the pawn promote. And whenever, you know, pieces get close trying to help the pawn promote, the king on a8 is going to be stalemated. So let me give you an example. Let's say like king here, king here. Bishop back here, here, here. Like if you try to, to like close up the king, like this, it's just gonna be still made. Um, let's say something like here, 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 king h5, king d7. You're never going to be able to get the king out of this square. So like king b5, king back, king here is a draw. Like you, you won't be able to win this, essentially. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wrong color bishop theory only applies to corner squares. Um, so yeah um for example if the pawn is in the center you know how you know how you know based on the opposition you can determine whether it's a draw or win but since you have the bishop you can spend times with the bishop you can spend you can waste tempos with the bishop and then you force the king to go to either side and then you enter with with your king through the other one and you help the pawn promote with your king does that make sense um, so if the pawn is in the center, you just, whenever you need to, you spend a t in tempo with your bishop. And that's just going to be, uh, that's just going to be a winning endgame. Uh, of course, draw only applies to rook pawns. And by rook pawns, I mean a file or h file. So yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is the, probably the last trick of the game. Uh, this is probably the last trick of the game. But let's go back. So not c5, not c5, just bishop b4. Bishop to f4, c5 now, king a7, c6, king b8, a5, king a7, a6. And you're kind of forcing the pawns to go on the opposite color, and then you're going to push the king backwards with the bishop. King to a8, bishop to c5, bishop to b8. And how do you guys win now? What's the method now? Almost everybody got it wrong. Yeah, that's that's why I asked you guys. It's tricky. You can't... It, that's why it's important to know the technical endgames and the result of those technical endgames because you don't want to get a winning position and then accidentally mess it up into a draw because you don't know the technical endgame. So that's why it's important to know, like, these endgames. Like, for example, like, the Voretsky uh, has a lot of technical endgames. That's why it's important to know them. So, yeah. A7, bishop takes, bishop takes, king takes, king to c5. Um, But what if a7, I move my bishop, though? Bishop b6, you force black to make a wrong move. What do you mean by a wrong move? Remember, if you play like this and the bishop goes back, it's not like you can play c7. I can take, take. And this is going to be a draw. So you're not really forcing me to make a bad move. But yeah. Usually, you know, this end games go by stages. So you already fulfill this stage of getting your pawns far enough and pushing the king towards a8 and, you know, keeping the king back. Now you go to the next stage, which is, you know, actually promoting the pawns. So 
How do you do that? You come around, exactly. So now, for example, uh, you can go king c4. And after king c4, let's say um, bishop c7. And then king d5, bishop d8. King e6, bishop c7. King there, bishop a5. What do you guys do here? How do you win? By the way, now that we're talking about knowing your endgames, uh, in the Charlotte tournament that I just finished playing, uh, I was on time pressures with, with this international master, and um, I was trying to save my position. It looked like it was really bad, um, but I was trying to save my position, and um, I got into a knight and rook versus rook endgame, and I had to be on the defending side. You know, as you guys probably know, that endgame is a draw. But it's very important to know your technique, otherwise you're in trouble. Especially against players that have more experience than you. Uh, they can trick you in this endgame. So that's why it's important to always practice them. And if you can practice them against computer, it's even better. Because if computer can't beat you, do you really think that a human will? So um, that's one, one thing that I can recommend to you guys to, to learn your technical in games probably not practical in games that's a lot harder but your technical in games you can learn um you can learn that way yeah exactly if if you're if you're better in an end game against someone in a tournament particularly like they're going to make you prove that you know how to checkmate them so it doesn't matter if you're on the defending side or the winning side it's always important to to know how to how to win or uh, sorry to know how to play the end game right um and i see that you guys have nice ideas just essentially just don't play c7 <laughs> that's the one thing that's the one thing i was hoping you guys wouldn't do c7 bishop takes king takes and it's the same thing it's still made now actually um but here you see that the bishop can be on a better diagonal and remember what i was mentioning of the bishop having two diagonals to protect and you can bring the bishop to e7. That's the last move of the. Oops, sorry. That's the last move of the game. And essentially, the idea is that, for example, bishop e6. Let's say bishop here. Then c7, and this is just absolutely crashing for for white. So yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Can you also do a waiting move? Um. You could do waiting moves, but you don't really need to do one here. Like when you, if you have like a straight forward win, does your sacrifice work with bishop b4? Uh, how? Oh, like bishop b4 here? I guess you could play bishop b4, but they're not going to take, they're probably going to play bishop b6. And it's just a, like a move longer. I mean, you're still winning, definitely. Um, but, yeah. What's the difference between technical endgame and practical endgame? Technical, I would say it's like the force endgame. Like the endgame that is already traded down to the point where... You can memorize the right technique to defend it or win it. Practical endgame, it's more like when you don't fully understand and you're basing yourself off of general principles. Like, let's say if you just trade at queens, you're probably on a more practical endgame because there's not a forced way to continue. Uh, you just have to play based on principles and your pawn structure. Uh, a technical endgame is like rook and pawn against rook, for example where things are already calculated out and all you need to do is memorize them, internalize it, and know how to defend the position under any circumstance. So that's usually the difference. <laughs> like wanting less Paul Islands and walking into a loss. Yeah, um, he did some, he did some uh, slightly poor technique with that b6 move. 
and not restricting white before their position got too good. So uh, one thing that I can say is don't play for a draw in games. Uh, play to win. Or, well, I guess if you're losing, then play for a draw. Or if you're inferior, do play for a draw. But don't just get into an endgame, you know, like an equal endgame, and then play passively because you think you can make a draw easily that way. You're just giving chances to your opponent to... to um, how do I say? You're just giving chances to your opponent to, to get a slightly better chance or get, like, the, initi the initiative. So I would say that it's probably better to, to just... Keep making active moves in the end games and scare your opponent too, you know? Like maybe they are the ones that make a mistake. And this mostly goes because when you play higher rated opponents, oftentimes you kind of want to make a draw. So you get into like an equal position, equal end game, and you think that it's going to be simple from then on, but then you don't have the best technique. And oftentimes it's because you're just playing for a draw, you're not playing for a win. And you miss chances that you may have, and you give your opponent chances by playing too passively. So. Um, that's some advice I can give you guys <laughs> about end games from what I know. And I hope you guys enjoyed this other lecture. Um, uh, I think we're going over to Twitch now for, um, analyzing your games. So you guys will be submitting games and I will be analyzing them. I think that's how it works. So, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Um, I mentioned it on the previous lecture like about an hour ago uh, but if you weren't there uh, please follow my uh, please follow my youtube channel tally tally 26 and my twitch tally tally 26 i streamed there today actually i analyzed some of my games um and you can check those out and um give it a follow say hi <laughs> do whatever you want um <laughs> Don't tell Caleb, but I think I like you slightly better. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So I hope you guys, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed today. Uh, I think we're going over to Twitch, so I hope I can see you guys over there. Um, see you guys some other time. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, bye bye. <laughs>